you have a heavenly breath and now it's air in our chest that's why we're singing it back to you for every battle you won for everything that you've done and everything that you're gonna do seem too much to ever doubt it Yesterday, I was praying for a miracle, scared to have a little hope. Now looking back today, seeing all the things you've done, I can't even add them up. One, two, three, up to infinity. I've run out of numbers before I could thank you for everything. God, I'm still counting my blessings All that you've done in my life The more that I look at the details The more of your goodness I find Father, on this side of heaven I know that I'll run out of time But I will keep counting my blessings seasons never last forever so God I will remember all of the reasons my heart has to be grateful all the times you've been faithful to me God I'm still counting my blessings all that you've done in my life the more that I look in the deep the more of your goodness I find Father on this side of heaven I know that I'll run out of time But I will keep counting my blessings Knowing I can't count them high
up to infinity. I ran out of numbers before I could thank you for everything. God, I'm still counting my blessings. God, I'm still counting my blessings. All that you've done in my life. All that you've done in my life. The more that I look in the deep. The more that I look in the deep. The more that I Let's pray real quick. God, thank you um, for your faithfulness. There are so many moments, chapters of our lives that, that we don't see it. We, we miss it. And God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see how faithful you are in our daily lives. Help us see that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last weekend, uh, we ended a series that was... Uh, it's been my favorite series that we've done this year. It was called Looking Back to Stay on Track. And if you were not here last week, um, I encourage you sometime today, go to our website and you can listen to the message. Uh, it's very important. It's the heart of our church. We've been looking back in order to stay on track, looking back at the early church and, and learning some things. And um, for some of us, I was talking to somebody after church last weekend, it's helping some of us unlearn some things that we learned that, that just weren't correct. Today, the title of our message is Promises, Promises. Anybody in here ever had someone make you a very important promise and then they didn't come through? Yeah. How many of you have ever made an important promise and didn't come through? All of us. Those early followers, when they saw the resurrected Jesus, they became convinced that he was who he said he was. Remember, they were following him. They had left everything. They left friends. They left family. They left careers. And they put their hope, their faith, their trust in him. And then when he was crucified, they lost faith. And who wouldn't? I mean, how could the Son of God be crucified? How, how, how could that happen? And then all of a sudden, three days later, Jesus is resurrected. And they're reminded of what he said. And they're like, oh my gosh, he told us about this. They once again began to put their faith and their trust and their hope in him. Only this time, nothing would ever again step in the way of them trusting him. Nothing would ever again get them off course. They decided this time we're going to trust him and we're going to follow him no matter what. They had what I would refer to as an authentic faith in Jesus. They now knew that he could be trusted. They knew he was who he said he was. And most importantly, they knew that he would promise what he said he was going to do. And our question for you today is, do you trust that God is going to do what he promised to do? I mean, like, if it's all on the line, do you really trust God to do what he promised to do? And then kind of this question goes along with it. Do you even know what God really promised? If you were anything like me, I grew up in church. My mom and dad started going to church when I was just an infant. And uh, we were a part of a Methodist church until I was in about third grade. And uh, then my parents thought they were doing something really good. And um, we became a part of a very charismatic, word of faith, crazy, everything but handle snakes um, type church. And uh, it, it was just absolutely just craziness that was going on. And I spent most of my adult life unlearning things about church that the church had told me, unlearning things about God that, that, that they're not even in the Bible. If you are here today and you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower, or if you're investigating Christianity going, you know, I'm kind of interested, um, we're instructed to live by faith. And in order to do that, you and I need to know what, what is faith. And, and we also need to know what faith isn't. I mean, it's imperative that we understand this. Because too often, especially today by the church, faith is presented as some kind of force or, or some kind of power, something that we can turn off when we need and then, you know, just, just turn it off. Like if we need it, we can hit the switch and, and there's this force, this power that, that is activated, but there's nothing further from the truth. And confusion in this one area is why so many people, and I mean so many people, abandon their faith. 
just like me, I'm sure today that you know several people in your life that, that would tell you, you know what, I used to be a Christian. I used to be a Christ follower. I used to believe, but, but not anymore. They, they might even say, you know what, I've, I've lost my faith or I've walked away from my faith. There's one big thing that often undermines faith, and that is unexplainable tragedy. The, those, those painful or adverse circumstances, they happen, and they just don't fit with our understanding of the character of God or the Christian faith. And when we're confronted with tragedy, we often ask the question like, how could a good God allow this? I mean, why didn't he stop this? It, it doesn't make sense. The inability to figure out why a good God would allow bad things to happen has caused thousands, and I mean thousands of people, to abandon their faith, to abandon Christianity. And so many times it's because the mantra of our faith is this, what's happening now, what I'm feeling now, determines what I believe for now. I want to say that again, what's happening now, what I'm feeling right now, determines what I believe for now. And I want to assure you, as long as our faith is grounded in what we see and what we experience, our faith will always, and I mean always, be fragile. It'll be circumstantial. It'll be totally dependent on our ability or our inability to interpret the events and circumstances around us. I mean, we like to try to put the pieces together all the time and try to figure things out. I mean, here's what I mean. If, if you pray for a loved one to be healed and they're not healed, a lot of times you interpret that as, well, God doesn't answer prayer or maybe he's disappointed in me. And then we come to the conclusion that God can't be trusted and our faith is shattered and, 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 and we abandon it. All of us, every single one of us in here is prone to misinterpret events. I mean, ask a four-year-old child who's being carried by his mom or dad into the doctor's office to get his tetanus shot. Ask him, does mom or dad love you? He's probably got doubts, doesn't he? I remember taking our kids in, kicking and screaming, but years later, guess what happens? That same child, you ask them about that same exact doctor visit, and they have a different perspective. They realize what was done was to keep them healthy. Just like a child can't correctly judge his parents' character based on one trip to the doctor, so you and I should dare not draw conclusions about God's goodness based upon an immediate circumstance based upon one thing. God's faithfulness and loving character are never, ever predicted upon the unfolding of circumstances. Never. Circumstantial faith is very fragile because its frame of reference is way, 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 and I mean way too small. So many times we have a hard time judging the significance of current events in context to a lifetime, much less weighing out those on a, on a scale of, say, eternity. Too many times we just can't see past the ever-changing landscape of our immediate surroundings. Well, we think things like, if God doesn't answer my prayer in a week or maybe two weeks, I'll give him two weeks, but if God doesn't answer a prayer in a week or two, we wonder if he even exists. If we don't see God at work in our present situation, and when I say at work, I mean at work the way we want and the time frame we want, we tend to lose confidence in it. We lose confidence that he loves us, that he cares about us, that he even exists. But authentic faith has the ability to look at the whole picture. And listen, we have to remind ourselves, we have to look at Scripture and remind ourselves about people in Scripture like Joseph. He spent 15 years as a slave in Egypt. And you know how he got into slavery? His brothers, his own flesh and blood who were jealous of him, sold him into slavery. 15 years. His tragedy was a part of this huge tapestry that God was, was weaving, if you will, behind the scenes to save an entire region from famine. Then there's a guy named Moses who spent 40 years in the wilderness before God sent him back to Egypt, freeing a nation from slavery and unfolding this purpose of, uh, uh, that was incredible. The, the problem that we have so often is just simply a faulty understanding of faith. Listen, the, the foundation of Christian faith is a person. It's not a circumstance, and we have to remember that. The foundation of this thing called Christianity, the Christian faith, it's faith in a person, not a circumstance. It's faith in the person of Jesus. We have to like redirect our faith away from current events and put it back on Jesus. There's a book in the Bible in the New Testament called Hebrews, a letter, if you will. It was written by a group of, written to, rather, a group of Christians who were being pressured by their community 
and by the circumstances that surrounded them to abandon their faith. And the writer of Hebrews comes along and he's encouraging his readers to keep believing on the basis of the identity of Christ. And in the first three chapters of this letter, he presents this mountain of evidence pointing towards the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King. He is the Son of God. And he says, you can believe this because we know that Jesus walked the earth. We know that he claimed to be the Son of God. We know he gave evidence supporting his claim. We know he died on the cross, and we know on the third day God raised him from the dead. And in plain view, he ascended into heaven in plain view of hundreds of witnesses. So the writer concluded by stating this to all of his readers and listeners. He says, therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Just like those first century followers of Jesus, we have to base our faith on the identity and the person of Jesus. If he really is who he said he was, we don't have to worry when bad things happen. We don't have to figure them out. If we have a high priest who understands us, it's going to be okay. If he really died for our sins, we have no reason to doubt his love for us. If he really meant it when he said he would one day return for us, we don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen next in this life. What's going to happen next in this country? But if our faith rests on anything other than the person of Jesus... We're building our faith on this fragile foundation. And what eventually is going to happen, if it hasn't already, is the choices of life will sway us to adapt or compromise what we believe. Circumstances will cause us to doubt God, His existence, His love. The foundation of our faith has to be on the person of Jesus. And in all honesty, faith is really, it's a simple concept that we've made very hard. But it's really simple. We just need to learn to accept faith for what it really is rather than what we want it to be. Did you hear that? We just need to learn to accept faith for what it really is rather than what we want it to be. So often we want faith to be a a power that moves God in our direction, the direction that we prescribe. We want it to be this code that unlocks the door to God's unlimited resources, resources that we can use at our discretion. Basically, we want faith to be a way for us to get our way. We want faith to be what gets our way. We want to be able to move God when we want Him to move. We want Him to leave us alone when we want Him to leave us alone. This way of thinking has been so ingrained in us that when God says no to a request, we have a tough time accepting that answer. We we have our grandsons with us this weekend, and, and we played outside yesterday, and our oldest grandson, Rhett, was just, I mean, he was a dirt ball. I mean, this kid was, he had played outside the whole day at their, at their farm before he came to our house. And, and, and so by 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, it was just a messy little mud ball. And, and Becky's like, you got to take a bath or a shower tonight. And, and, and it's the typical, I don't know, why should I take one? We were like, because you stink, and we don't like stink in our house. Well, mom and dad don't make me. Well, boy, mom and dad aren't here. Do you see your mom and dad? I don't either. And they've never paid the mortgage here, okay? So here's what it goes. In our house, you're going to take a bath tonight. We don't want you getting in the bed here. Oh, oh my gosh, you know, this is a big deal. And so he decides he wants to take a bath, not a shower. And he gets in the tub, and he always does this thing. He wants to drink the water as it's coming out. And so Papa always says, listen, listen, we're going to get you good and clean from head to toe, and then we're going to drain all that nasty water and nastiness out of the tub. We'll fill it back up with some fresh water. It'll be a little cold so you can do your thing and drink, but be careful because that thing is metal, all right? Stay back here. And he's lapping like a dog, drinking the water, and I'm like, Rhett, about the 10th time I'm you know, getting frustrated, Rhett, stay back. And, and then all of a sudden, I turn to, to get the towel, and when I turn around, he's holding his mouth crying because he's crashed right into the faucet where the water's running out, and he's looking at me in utter disbelief. Like, I can't believe you didn't tell me how dangerous this could be, how bad it would hurt. What kind of papa are you? You stink at this. You might have been an okay dad to my dad, but you were horrible. All these thoughts are just being pierced in me by his face. And I pick him up and I wrap the towel around him. He's crying. He's got a little blood coming out. And and I go, go, you you look surprised. And he's like, I am. I go, why? He goes, I didn't see that coming. 
I'm like, how old are you three? I didn't see it coming. I'm like, Rhett, can I, can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah, Paul, Paul. I go, how many times have I told you that that, that is going to hurt if you keep doing that? That's why I was saying no. I, was say, I had a reason to say no. I'm not just a killjoy. I want you to have fun here. I want to be the best papa. I want you to go to your other papa and say, I like that papa better, all right? You do too if you have grandkids, so laugh all you want, but it's true. We do. And if, if, if you're divorced and you got the kids one weekend, be honest. You want the kids to be like, I had more fun there. I mean, we're, we're messed up, but we're messed up together, all right? We're floating in the same boat. I don't want to be the killjoy. I want to have fun, but I want to be safe. And when I kept saying, no, 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 he just, oh my gosh, this is like, why, why? Because he didn't understand. He has some understanding now that that metal hurts your little gum and your tongue and your teeth. But when God says no to us, we, we assume, oh my gosh, there, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with God or there's something wrong with us. All of us in this room, we know people who have abandoned their faith because God wouldn't cooperate with them. And some of us have abandoned our faith because God wouldn't cooperate with us. Some of you may be on the verge of abandoning because God just won't cooperate. I mean, so many of us believe that God's obligated to act on our faith. And then when he doesn't, we get all bent out of shape. Listen, biblical faith is not a force or a power. It, it's not something spooky that you can figure out how to tap into. And it's certainly not a tool to get what you want from God. Uh, biblical faith, it, it, it's not just mere confidence either. If, if you are a basketball fan, when you watch a basketball team burst out of the locker room and they're headed down the hallway getting ready to hit the court, those players, they, they have this look of confidence. They believe that they're going to win. And if you went out into the stands and the bleachers and asked the fans, hey, do you have faith in your team to win tonight? They'd all scream yes. But that's not biblical faith. That's confidence. It's just confidence that they will. And many Christians think if they can muster up enough confidence that God will act on their behalf. But faith and confidence aren't the same thing. Look what the writer of Hebrews says faith is. He says, now faith is confidence in not faith is confidence. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You can think of it this way. You, you could send me an email and say, Russ, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm needing some finances right now. And, and, and I, I really, I need you to give me $5,000. However, you wouldn't have faith that I would. Oh, hopefully you don't have faith that I would. If you ask me for that, you might wish I would. You might hope I would. You might even be praying I would. But check this out. If I replied to your email and said, hey, I just got your email. So you needed $5,000. Sure, meet me at my office at, at 2.30 today. I'll give you $5,000. What happens is now your confidence just turned into faith because I've said something. And now you would have faith because of what I said. My promise to give it to you would allow you to move from wishful thinking to, oh, I, I have faith this is going to happen now. We don't need to merely wish that God would have our best interest in mind. We don't need to just pray that God would have our best interest in mind. We can absolutely be confident that he does because he sent Jesus to prove that. This is what authentic faith is. Authentic faith is confidence that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he's promised to do. Our confidence must be in the absolute promises and the unchanging character of God. In Hebrews, the writer cites dozens of illustrations of people who showed authentic biblical faith. And in every case, that faith was grounded in a promise from God. Abraham left his home, and he sets out on this journey without a destination in mind because God promised to lead him to a new home. Gideon charged into this enemy camp. I mean, he's outnumbered and surrounded, but God promised him victory. A guy named Joshua marched around Jericho until the walls fell down because God promised him success. I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine how you and I could live and deal with this crazy life that we live in if we could begin to live with authentic faith. Unfortunately, we often resist the definition of faith because we want to be in the driver's seat. We want to be in control. There's something in us that wants faith to put us in control. We're always trying to find the magic prayer that would force God to do our bidding. But biblical faith puts God in control of our lives. 
Biblical faith says, God, here you go. Authentic faith leaves him with the option to say no. Only when we come to terms with the true nature of faith will we be able to surrender our will to God's will. The outcome of authentic faith, of a life lived of authentic faith, is that we are in alignment with the will of God. But as long as we're trying to get something from God, we're going to have a difficult time surrendering our lives to Him. God can be trusted to do all He promised to do. Therefore, it is imperative that you and I know and understand, well, what has He promised? Because if you grew up like me in the church, we heard a lot of promises. And then when I developed my adult faith, when I went from my child faith to my adult faith, and I started looking through the scripture, I'm like, where in the world did that pastor get that? Where did that evangelist get that? Where did that guy on TV with the big hair get that? That doesn't say that in scripture. Earlier I said the tragedy of people abandoning their faith is is often because of, of this just horrible tragedy. But the underlying cause is actually unmet expectations. We have to learn to distinguish between God's promises and our own expectations. Look, there are so many things that God has not promised that you and I wish He had. God never promised to keep bad things from happening to us. I grew up in a church that, that they, they said, if bad things happen, you're not, you're not in the will of God. I mean, if bad things are happening, you need to get your act together. You're, you're living wrong. There must be sin in your life. And then I find what John writes in Scripture. He says this, he's quoting Jesus. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. And I look back at my child faith and that guy who said that to me and went, dude, you were a liar. I mean, you were a bold-faced liar. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome it, but you're going to have some trouble. God never promised to heal every illness. I said in the church where we heard over and over, by Jesus stripes, you're healed. Look, this is what this is going on. And when my dad died at a very young age, I watched these guys, quote unquote, men of faith. They came to the hospital where my dad was at. And they told my sister and I, you need to leave the room because we know that you guys don't have faith. That's part of the reason your daddy died because you guys didn't hold the faith. So we need you and your doubt to leave the room because we're going to lay hands on him. We're going to raise him from the dead. And you know what? Not one of those godly men showed up at my father's memorial service. Not one of them had the courage to walk down and look at my grandmother. Not one of them had the courage or the dignity or the respect or the character to look at myself and my sister and say, we did something wrong. God didn't promise to heal every illness. He never promised to reverse the consequences of bad decision or sin. We have to remember the experiences of those early church people, those apostles, those great men of faith, yet their lives were far from free of difficulties and loss. But these men understood that the foundation of their faith wasn't always getting what they wanted. And it wasn't their ability to figure out what God was or wasn't up to. Their faith was grounded in a risen Savior. So so what did God promise? Remember what the writer wrote? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Then he says this, So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can draw near to God, go to God with confidence. Confidence in what? And you might go, yeah, I mean, you already told me I might not get what I asked for. So what am I, what, what's the deal here? What should I have confidence in? You can have confidence that every single time, no matter what you face, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's going on around us, you can have confidence that God will every time give you these two things, two things that are the most critical in a time of need. He'll give us mercy and he'll give us grace. And at first glance, if you're like me, you're like, hey, That's not cutting it. I got a plan, God. I got a plan, and I know how to do this. I mean, what'd you do? Create the universe? Look what I've done. 
God, I, I, I got an idea. And he says, no, I'm promising you grace and mercy. Sometimes that mercy is simply the, the comfort that we can feel knowing that we can just pour our hearts out to him and he's going to give us his undivided attention. We were picking our grandsons up the other day and my son looked at me and he goes, Dad, can I, can I have just a minute? And my oldest son doesn't, doesn't we, we don't talk a lot about, about the deep things. And um, he's like, can I just can I talk to you away from mom for a second, away from the, my wife and the boys? And, and we went around the other side of the car and I go, yeah. And he goes, Dad, listen, I'm like, I'm excited. Um, the boys always love coming to, to, to your house. They always want to go to Mimi and Papa's house. And, um, and, and I, I love it. But a few weeks ago when they stayed and we came and picked them up, the whole way home, one of them was crying because he wanted to go back. And he said, and then that night we were putting him to bed and he said, we were getting ready to say his prayers before we went to bed. And, and, and he said, I'm going to pray that I can go back to Mimi and Papa's tomorrow. And, and my son said, why? And he goes, because I like it there better. And, and my son goes, Dad, you know what that's doing to me? And I went, I sure do. S same thing it did to me when you did this to my mom and dad, sucker. And, you know, it, that human side comes out, right? You're like, hey, check that out. It hurts, doesn't it? Uh -huh, take that. And I said, I go, Quinn, l listen, man, don't, don't, just don't even give it a second of thought. He goes, I, 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 what do you mean give it a second thought? I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks. He goes, Dad, wh why, why do they want to come? And I said, I, I want to tell you something that happens. And I said, no, nobody told me this. Nobody explained this or I would have been more excited because I, I was apprehensive. I didn't want to be a grandfather. I was like, I just now got three of you out. I just, you know, we, doing, we feel like we're rich now and I don't need any more children coming in because we got more crumb snatchers. Now I'm going to be giving up more. And, 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 but they came in and everything changed. And I said, Quinn, here's what nobody ever told. When your boys come to our house, guess what? Your mom and I are in this stage of life that, that something happens and we can plan for them to come. And from the second they get to our house until they go home, it's all about them. I mean, we just give them our undivided attention. You guys don't have that luxury right now, right? And they live on a farm. So you got to take care of the horses and you got to take care of the chickens and you got to take care of the cows and you got 40 acres that need to be mowed and you got to do this and you, and you got to do that while you're juggling. But when they come here, they, they, they don't like us better. Trust me. They don't like us better. They like you. They love you. They need you. But what they like is they like to come and just go, it's going to be about me all weekend long. Somebody knocked on our door yesterday. I hope it wasn't one of you because we didn't answer. All right. Somebody knocked on the door. I got three or four text messages, emails, and I didn't realize until hours later that I got them because we're just saturated going, this is it. Do you know that you and I serve a God that we go to and he can somehow, even when other people are calling out, give you and I undivided attention? Do you know what that's like? Some of you don't because some of you didn't grow up in a home where you got the attention. And some of you didn't have a grandmama or a grandfather that gave you attention. But I'm t I did. I like going to my grandmother's in Dutzow, Missouri. My grandmother, when we started going to her house, was already in her early mid-70s. And, and, and it wasn't like she was coming outside throwing the baseball around with us. She threw us around every once in a while, but she didn't throw the baseball around. We went fishing every once in a while. But the reason I like going there is because from the second I got there until I left, it was all about Russ. I could tell my grandmother anything, and she was never disappointed. She would always encourage me. I could share whatever was on my mind, and there was a comfort in that. We have a God that we can do that with. Other times, the mercy just, it gives us relief. Some of you understand that you just sometimes need emotional and physical relief. Mercy is the assurance that God will never allow the pressures of this life to be more than we can bear. And that's important. See, our Savior knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And Scripture says when Jesus lived on the earth, He experienced temptation. Temptation far worse than us. He experienced temptation from Satan himself. He was rejected by his friends and family. He experienced failure when everything he worked for him was about what everything he stood for. It crumbled around him. He knows fear. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so scared and stressed that Scripture says he sweat blood. He was abandoned by his friends. And he experienced loneliness when he faced death alone on that cross. And my point is this. We have a Savior who understands what we go through. He's felt what we feel, and He knows what we need. We can go to Him and be totally transparent 
and be confident that he's never going to go, I can't believe you feel that way. I don't understand why you look at life that way. What's your problem? He is a mercy-giving God. But his promises don't stop with mercy. He also promises grace. And this is what grace means. The strength to endure and the ability to carry on. The strength to endure and the ability to carry on. He never promised to deliver us from our circumstances, but he did say, I will walk through every single thing with you. And at first glance, it doesn't seem too comfortable, but it is. And this doesn't mean you and I can't pray and ask God for things. I do all the time. I pray and I hope and I wish. But if God doesn't come through the way we want, when we want, exactly everything lined up how we want and we prayed, it doesn't mean he's abandoned us. He's there. And his grace is going to be sufficient. So authentic faith is believing that Jesus is who he said he is and that he'll do what he promised he would do. The, the writer of Proverbs tells us that there's something attached to or guaranteed to people who have authentic faith. He says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. In other words, if we really trust God with every area of our lives, he'll give us guidance He'll make our path and our direction in life that we're supposed to go, he'll make it clear to us. Thomas Merton was an American Trappist monk, and he said something once that's just so profound. He said, we receive enlightenment only in the proportion as we give ourselves more and more completely to God by humble submission and love. We do not first see and then act. We act and then we see. That is why the man who waits to see clearly before he will believe never starts the journey. We're going to never, on this side of eternity, we're not going to figure out or understand God. It's impossible. But we can know that he loves us because of Jesus. And we can trust Jesus because he did what he said he was going to do. He died and God raised him from the dead. He's trustworthy. He's worth following. And following Jesus makes you and I better at life. And following Jesus makes life better. And he will guarantee us mercy and grace every single time. Let's pray. God, we live in a crazy world with so many messed up, hateful, unjust things going on. And that is just on top of things that we experience personally. Father, I pray today by the power of your spirit that you would give us eyes to see who you really are. God, give us faith to trust that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do. And God, I thank you that we can have true faith, authentic faith in you, that in our times of struggle and distress and adversity and need, that every time you will give us the mercy that we need and the grace to carry on. God, help us fix our eyes on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.